Raywat Dionandan is a Toronto writer. He describes himself as being of Indian ancestry, Guyanese origin, and Canadian citizenship. His short stories have been published in Canada, the U.S., England, and China, and he's won several prizes for fiction. Here he is to introduce a story from his first collection. Hi, my name is Raywat Dionandan, and I'm going to be reading to you from my book called Sweet Like Salt Water. The book is uh, ostensibly about the Indo-Caribbean diaspora, which is a fancy way of saying it's about immigration. But the story I've chosen to read to you is uh, called Seasonal Youth, and it's more about the things that are lost when we grow older. And ironically, it was written 17 years ago when I was a teenager for a short story contest. And uh, it has since appeared in Beijing in an English textbook, no less. I think mostly because it has no political content. So I hope you enjoy it. Seasonal Youth It was a normal day. Not too hot, not too cold, no excess of chores or of idleness. Yes, the day was ideal. The warm sun glowed brightly over the gently curving horizon. The scene was pretty, colorful, and again quite normal. Down past the streams, the village slept quietly, and all the inhabitants were off working in the fields. It was a good day for such work, for the air was charged with invigorating currents, and the sky was that peculiar hue of rural happiness. It was such a good day, in fact, that one would not wish it ever to end. And so it was with Ball. It was good to be young, Ball thought, because youth is the only reason for living. Saplings spring forth in early summer, and even the first cold hints of winter spell youthful wonder for the children of the village. Ball turned his attendant at the waning hillside, so green and vibrant. This was how life was meant to be lived. It would be a pity to waste your years chasing dreams, he thought, when you could enjoy your entire existence right here in your own village, where adventures were to be found in every anthill and romance behind every barn. Up ahead he saw a tattered figure, an old man, no doubt, come to beg from the farmers. Very well, then, Ball thought, I shall give him some of my fruit. He set his sack down upon the soft earth and began searching for a suitable morsel. As he looked up again, he saw the old beggar only a few feet from him. But the vagrant took no notice of the youth, only of his own shoes, and he was muttering under his breath. Ball stood upright and held his hand out in front of him. In it was a gloriously red apple but the transient failed to notice his offer and kept on walking, right past Ball and his gift. Well, that's no way to treat a fellow traveler, said Ball to himself, and he saddled up alongside the strange individual. He began to speak, but stopped in mid-sentence, for he caught a wisp of what the stranger was muttering. Three hundred and eight, three hundred and nine, three hundred and ten. Good grief, Ball thought. He's counting to himself. Excuse me, good sir, said Ball. Excuse me. Eh, what? Who are you? The stranger looked rather startled. I am Ball. I live down at that village. Ball pointed behind him. So, I see. Well, what do you want, Ball? I see that you're hungry. May I offer you some food? He held the apple up to the stranger's face. No, thank you, son. I have work to do. Now, this was quite a surprise to young Ball, who had always considered work to be digging, cleaning, harvesting, or some activity of comparable sweat production. Pardon me, good sir, he asked, but what kind of work are you involved in? What kind of work? Why, you must be young indeed, the vagrant brightened some. I'm counting. I count every step I take. But why? Ball was now thoroughly bewildered. To see how far I've been, of course. Here, you try it. Ball hung his head low and 
mumbled apologetically. I'm sorry, he said. I'm not allowed to stray far from home. No problem, the beggar said. Just you walk about in wide circles around the hill. No harm in trying, Ball said inwardly. He began to take careful steps around the green hillock, never removing his eyes from his stained and hardened shoes. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, ninety-six, ninety-seven. Ball yawned most profusely. He looked into the sky and stretched his aching muscles. He reached into his sack for a snack, but found only rotten fruit. And the stranger was gone. Now that was mighty queer. But the queerest thing of all was that Ball could not find his beloved village. No matter how long or hard he searched, the village could not be seen through the wailing blizzard. And Ball felt old, very old.